I'm Catherine Steves from Western Libraries, and it's my pleasure to join my colleague, Jacqueline White Appleby, the Associate Director of Scholars Portal, to introduce you to an exciting new OCO program. For those of you not yet familiar with the Ontario Council of University Libraries, it was founded in 1967, so we have a long tradition of collaboration. And in 2002, OCO Scholars Portal was established a shared technology infrastructure to provide common platforms for digital content and services to support research. Today, the digital infrastructure is quite significant. The number of digital research services has grown and the size of the data and document repository is substantial. Our services extend beyond Ontario via service level agreements with institutions from other provinces and some services are now national such as Borealis and the latest edition, Scalaris, a National Institutional Repository Service. To give you a sense of the scope, here are some key metrics about our data center. And although OCL has continually evolved Scholars Portal Services in response to developments in research, scholarly publishing, and technology over time, we are at a tipping point where unprecedented, rapid, developing artificial intelligence and other machine learning technologies promise to revolutionize industries, sectors, communities, and society. And of course, to also transform research in higher education. And as I know, I'm sure you are all aware, these new technologies have exceptional transformational power. So OCL, decided to directly engage with this in all its complexity and in the recognition that to remain relevant into the future, we will need to integrate these new technologies into our work and our digital research infrastructure and services wisely and ethically and in the interests of humanity for knowledge creation. And so we struck a task force. The task force is comprised of um, library directors. Uh, you can see their names here and their institutions, a good representation from across our province, as well uh, the OCL executive director and the scholars portal director, Amy Greenberg and Kate Davis were key members of the task force. And Mike Ridley, the university librarian emeritus from the University of Guelph really helped to lead the charge. He's an expert in machine learning. He's done his PhD in the area and he um, volunteered and dedicated a lot of time to participate in the task force and help us under understand the scope of the technologies and to build some critical connections. And it was clear we knew uh, from our discussions at the task force that we needed to engage broadly in these considerations, that we couldn't go off and do our work and then uh, issue a report and so we started our consultations as early as the spring and summer of 2023 that's where the some of the ideas came forward for the task force we brought a proposal to the local directors in the fall in order to see if we could get a commitment for some startup funds in the next fiscal year and we did get that support in principle we created a national community of practice, which launched in January of 2024 to encourage dialogue across the nation and uh, across a number of different topics. I believe there's over a dozen channels right now in that community of practice. We hosted a hack fest at McMaster University in February. And when the interim report was ready, we released it publicly. We sought public feedback and we hosted a national summit with about 100 participants to really um, have a broad dialogue and discussion and in some regards, a bit of a debate about the use cases explored and some of the, um, the key issues and other concerns or opportunities that artificial intelligence offers the academic library community in Canada. And we have been building connections across the nation with other organizations. So the task force goals were to provide a compelling case for collaborative action, to identify relevant use cases, issues, and challenges, and to present a strategic action plan to build capacity to explore and implement AI. 
and coming out of the summit and the discussion of, of the report, it was clear that there was a consensus that artificial intelligence could be best understood, managed, and realized if OCO libraries work together on a select number of core initiatives. All right, so the final report, the final report um, was grounded in principles for responsible AI. We wish to center equity, diversity, and inclusion throughout the program to enhance accessibility. We're committed to human in the loop development where humans, or people, or library staff play an interactive and iterative role in the model and program's development. We wish to ensure transparency and explainability and where possible, we hope to integrate open source tools and solutions. And in our strategy, we will maximize the availability of tools and services and outcomes to support both English and French speaking learners and researchers. We, were gonna, we are going to select use cases that could be implemented as operational projects for the benefit of library users. So we're not ex only exploring or experimenting for the sake of exploration, but we have selected use cases that could be implemented and hopefully will as operational services. And finally, uh, we will use these projects that we select and the related work to build capacity in our libraries and also to improve AI and machine learning awareness, knowledge and technical skills. And so the Program recommendations that you will see in the report are for five projects. The report identifies the resources required to get started um, and also potentially commits <laughs> to identifying ongoing resources for those projects that are successful. So as a part of this, we will also be identifying and applying for funding opportunities and a governance and project management structure was outlined in the report. And so Jacqueline is going to take you through the five projects. Thanks, Catherine. So these are the five that the task force ultimately coalesced around, and I'm going to walk you through each of them. So the first is an audio to text pipeline that we're building using Whisper. Whisper is an open AI tool. It's used for speech recognition. It's a tool that many of our schools have indicated an interest in trying out. There are many different use cases for this tool um, from on the fly translation to increasing the discoverability of archival recordings. So the goal here is for Scholars Portal to set up a Whisper server so that staff at OCL member libraries can begin using the tool without a lot of overhead. They don't need to install it, they don't need to maintain it, they don't need to worry about the security. And the bigger goal here is to understand how to make use of these tools effectively in a consortial context. So we need to be thinking about what it means to set up a service to maintain it potentially shut it down? What do we do with the data? Do we archive it? Do we destroy it? What is the appropriate level of documentation? These are all questions that we need to answer if we're going to be running a service like this, and Whisper is how we're going to try to figure that out. What I have up here is a, a simple sort of test case that we're working on where users from different schools can drop uh, typically mp4 files, so video files, into, uh, into Whisper, and they will be processed uh, in order, and then they will return back an output file, which can be text or uh, TSV or uh, JSON. So that's something we're trying out. The next project is around virtual reference. So Scholars Portal has overseen the Oakville Shared Virtual Reference Program since 2012. We answer about 30,000 chats a year. It's a bilingual service staffed seven days a week. And this project has two parts. So the first part is working with Library Help, who are the software developer of the tool that we use. And this is on a chatbot for frequently asked questions. So this is something they're already doing with public libraries and they're looking for development partners on the university side. Obviously there's a lot of curiosity, but also rightful skepticism and reticence around this kind of exploration. So we're approaching it slowly, lots of different conversations. The intention is not to replace reference service, it's to explore where there might be useful places to augment it. And then the second use case uh, is a slightly smaller one, but it's not infrequently the case that we get requests from librarians who want to use a large collection of chat transcripts in their own research. It is a very rich data source. 
We have long-term policies that sort of govern how people might be able to get access to these chat transcripts. But the big thing is that they have to be anonymized before anybody can work with them. So we're looking at some ways to use machine learning to um, better be able to sort of process those to make them anonymous for use. The third project that I'm going to talk about is uh, enhancing the discoverability of government documents. So we at Scholars Portal have collected government documents and publications for a long time, and they come with extremely varied levels of metadata. In the last few years, the University of Toronto has digitized over 50,000 documents from their physical GovDocs collection. They made them all available online, which is very exciting, but a lot of them were never cataloged. So as you can see, some don't have creators, some don't have a uh, year of publication, and some don't have anything. That's just a barcode, that number that's starting 3176. So there's no metadata. And with government documents in particular, context is so important to understanding what's in them. So we'd like to explore how we can build some of that context. So we're thinking about how to use a, lang a language model and uh, specifically how to use retrieval augmented generation to build context around these documents. Government documents are interesting also because there is a lot of structure in the background of these, right? They come from specific ministries, specific departments within specific jurisdictions, and they are all connected to each other. So how do we use that structure to better build a context around our digital objects? So we're going to start with this 50,000, this set of 50,000 documents, but we also have a lot of other GovDocs collections, and we also have census data. We have a lot of geospatial data that we host. What kind of links can we build between these different types of documents to increase findability, discoverability, and browsability, ideally? The fourth project that I'm going to talk about is improving accessibility and usability for documents scanned for ACE, which is the Accessible Content ePortal. This is a platform for digitizing print-only books in a variety of formats. The goal is to make these books more accessible, but digitization is really only the first step in making that content accessible. So we're looking at tools to incorporate into the ACE workflow to improve the structuring of these documents. And what I have up on the screen here are examples of table of contents from books that we've scanned. Table of contents are famously challenging structurally because they're all very different. This is just a random sample, but you can see how varied they are in where the number sits, the subheadings, the sub subheadings, including authors, including uh, subtitles, those dots really mess up the computer. Um, so, so trying to teach uh, a machine to better understand the structure of these documents um, so that they're easier to navigate. And then we're also looking to generate summaries for a lot of these books. They're older print texts. They don't have abstracts or co cover, bur cover blurbs, and they're very big files. So it's a really easy win if we're able to uh, give a user a quick summary before they decide if they want to engage with this huge file using assistive technology. And then the final project is the one that's least scoped, but really has the potential to be quite impactful. Um, because over and over during consultation, we heard that staff want to know more and managers want their staff to have a higher level of concept of comfort with the concepts and topics and tools that we're talking about. So this project will touch on teaching and learning, research, but also the sort of day-to-day -day administration and operations of libraries and universities data and analytics, and also um, really try to give time and space to the ethical and integrity concerns, as well as copyright and IP concerns that come up with this kind of technology. So we're going to be exploring partnerships. There's going to be a lot of facilitation of training for members, both sort of high level intro training, but also for some staff, some pretty specific technical training. And this is really uh, the sort of two year journey that we're going to try to be on together. And so those are our projects, and I'll pass it back to Catherine to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up with an overview of our program and project governance structure. And so we've identified a program leadership team, and I have the privilege of acting as program director. Uh, we have engaged a technical manager. We will be hiring a project manager and an AI developer to support the projects and be a part of the leadership team. And of course, the OCAL executive director and scholars portal director will be integral to the leadership for this exploration and the potential implementation into the future. So the next slide is quite a complex view, uh, but it identifies each of the five projects. 
the project lead or leads, whatever the case may be, who else may be a part of the, the core project team, and resources or advisory roles that will be essential to the success. From a governance perspective, the project leads and the project leadership team will work together as a project's operational team and we will report through to the OCAL executive. And finally, we're going to strike two advisory groups. One, to provide advice on compute and infrastructure technology, and another, because we do anticipate this will be quite a collaborative partnership because the need is so high across the nation, an advisory committee on the training or capacity building components. And so with that, um, I'll share the next steps. And right now, over the summer, we are starting to draft an overall pro program plan. From there, we will move on to the establishment of project charters and convene the project teams. As you know, we're recruiting uh, for some of those key positions. And once the project charters are in place and the teams convened, we will establish the advisory groups and engage staff further across um, OCO. And we anticipate that there will be a staggered project implementation. Some are already um, underway, others are more fully defined, defined and some will, will start a little bit later on. And so if you would like more information, we have the links here for the interim and final report, as well as the job posting and where you may go to follow um, our program updates. And please feel free to reach out to either myself or to Jacqueline if you would like more information. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks. Bye.